Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for SME's Technical Community and AeroDef Manufacturing Satellite Session. In today's webinar, Ceramic Matrix Composites Taking Flight at GE Avi Aviation, you'll learn how GE Aviation is developing advanced materials for turbine applications, including the recent certification of Ceramic Matrix Composites, or CMCs, on the LEAP engine. You'll hear about the process in developing this advanced material, including testing challenges, lifting methods, lifting method development, and the role of process modeling in manufacturing scale-up. I'm Carl Mitroff, AeroDef Manufacturing Conference Manager. Thank you for joining us. Before we get going, just want to cover a few housekeeping items so they're all aware how this web, uh, webinar will work. Uh, your microphones, you'll notice, are automatically muted. And if you have any questions regarding the functionality, uh, we have uh, the chat feature that you could use and pose questions and we'll try to respond to you quickly. Uh, we encourage you to use the Q&A function for this webinar to type in your technical questions that you would like to ask. And you're welcome to engage with that at any moment so that we can start to see the questions in advance. And in the event of any technical glitches, uh, we are recording this presentation and we will make it available on our website uh, shortly after this webinar. So moderating today's webinar is Randy Capasir. Randy is the Strategy Initiatives Leader for Supply Chain in GE Aviation's military business. In his role, he coordinates the development of strategies, plans, and resources for maturing and implementing a wide range of manufacturing technologies into production of future military aircraft engine components for both composites and metals. Randy has a bachelor's degree in manufacturing engineering from Miami University and a master's in business administration from the University of Cincinnati. Randy is also an active advisor on the AeroDef conference and a big supporter of SME. Thank you, Randy, for moderating this uh, afternoon's webinar. I appreciate your support and I'll kick it off to you. Thanks, Carl. Um, this is really uh, an exciting time. Um, we, we were talking right before this, this uh, call started around uh, how often we have a chance to talk about CMCs, especially in, in space of uh, uh, GEs and what they've done here. And um, we're fortunate to have one of, um, one of the leaders at GE in that space, um, Jim Stiebel, who is a um, consulting engineer for uh, CMC materials, which is ceramic matrix composites materials, um, and manufacturing at GE Aviation is uh, going to be the one presenting today. Jim uh, has a BS and an MS in ceramic engineering from Missouri University of Science and Technology. He has over 30 years of uh, experience focused on the development and application of CMC technology, including 25 patents in the field of SIC based, uh, silicon based uh, uh, composites, silicon carbon. Um, he's also served on the executive board of the United States Advanced Ceramics Composites for over five years. So Jim is one of the key guys here, and, and GE has uh, really um, gone full bore into uh, um, CMCs. And I um, hope you enjoy this uh, presentation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Thanks, Randy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate your interest in our one of our more advanced materials, one of the higher technology composite materials that we have now implemented into our turbine engines. I look forward to telling you um, about the work we've done over the last 30 years, most of it within the last 10 years, as we've looked to mature this technology and get it into service. So my role is currently in supply chain where Randy resides as well, but at the same time, I'm also actively seeking external markets for this material as we built up the supply chain capacity um, that um, enables pursuing other external opportunities beyond turbine engines. But the focus today is primarily turbine engines. So if you move the chart forward, please. I'd be uh, first reviewing the material systems. Again, as was mentioned, these are silicon carbide based materials. And hopefully you'll appreciate some of the reasons why silicon carbide is preferred material for these turbine applications after going through this. Go through other material systems as well, but the majority of our investment has been in the silicon carbide fiber reinforced 
Midland Carbide Matrix Deposit System. So we'll go through most of what we've done there. Touch on as well beyond the engineering development aspects, the application aspects, we get into our manufacturing side and what we have done to build up our own supply chain. And then lastly, what I touched on just a few minutes ago is where we're headed beyond turbine engine applications. Okay. So first, um, if you move forward, please, on the slides. When we look at the uh, advancement of our turbine engine performance in these machines, the advancement of materials has played a key role over you know, the past 50 plus years in advancing our, our capability of our engines. And it's really all relates to the temperature capability and the specific strength in particular that enables this improvement in thermal efficiency. And in a simple way of thinking about it, as you reduce the amount of cooling flow that's required to be routed around the core of the turbine, that cooling flow is required in many cases to extend the life and durability of the materials in the hot section of the engine. Then in that case, if we can reduce the amount of cooling flow required, hence increase the temperature capability of materials that you build these components out of, you can get additional benefits in the turbine engine performance, such as fuel uh, burn reduction on the commercial side or possibly improved engine thrust on the military side. So the turbine engine material temperature capability really enables this capability. So if you look at the materials across our turbines, um, you may be looking at the front end or the back end of the engines where it's cooler when you talk some of the alloys of titanium. Uh, Nickel-based super alloys are really the workhorse in the hot section of our engines. So many of our uh, developments are done in conjunction with comparing CMCs to those systems. Um, but as you get into above 2000F, you really move to a region where you're starting to compromise the properties of metals to enable that type of temperature capability. And it's this comparison that has really opened the door for a new material like CMCs. And if you look back at the fundamentals on the right side of this chart as to why the properties of CMCs are different, I think it's really important to think about the types of bonding, the covalent bonding, in the center of the three options shown here is very different where electrons are held very closely by adjacent atoms as opposed to them being spread across a cloud of atoms, which is the case in metallic. And so in the covalent case, it takes a lot of energy to break the bonds. It takes a lot of energy to um, uh, deform the material. And hence, that's why ceramics are stiff. It's why they take uh, high thermal resistance in other words, thermal energy to, to cause the material to expand or deform. And it's really the basis um, of why ceramics behave the way they do. The downside of that is the material is a bit brittle. So we'll have to talk a bit about how that um, is being addressed with our composite systems. Okay, next slide, please. So as with the assessment, evaluation, or implementation of any new material into our turbines, we do engine level studies to try to understand what the benefits might be and see if it's worth the investment because the investment, the timelines for these types of new material implementation projects are many years and often decades. So in this case, we looked at the combustor liner on the lower left. And if you reduce the cooling flow by having a more temperature capable uh, CMC uh, liner itself to create the chamber, it's really nitrous oxide emissions, which is a key benefit. And that benefit is even greater as we go to higher pressure engines. Now for within the turbine, this example here is really shown for a military application. And in fact, the engine cross section above is a military engine where we show some examples of CMC parts we made along the way throughout the turbine. But in this case, again, compared to the incumbent nickel-based super alloy that are single crystal materials, we looked at three different uh, pedigrees of CMCs in relation to their temperature capability, substituting CMCs for the airfoils within the turbines, and what that means in terms of either specific fuel consumption, which is a reduction 
or a thrust to weight, which would be an increase, and that's the blue bars in this Pareto chart. So you can kind of get a feel for, you know, up to 10% reduction in specific fuel consumption is tremendous amount. If you think about the amount uh, frequency of flights and things that our military does with the particular application with our engines, or likewise, the additional benefit that our pilots would would um, desire if you're looking to get out of harm's way with a higher thrust engine. So CMCs themselves can have a significant impact on these types of turbine engine performance characteristics, all enabled by the higher temperature capability primarily. Okay, next chart, please. So continuing on with looking at our various engines as we develop the technology, we actually did some early testing on both commercial and military engines. A lot of the early work um, was funded by NASA. It ultimately led to a program where we made a set of combustor liners and put them into a commercial engine, and that test look, was very successful. And then on the other end of the spectrum, more on the back end of a military engine, we took low-pressure turbine blades and did some early turbine blade testing work, which is a very complex airfoil. And then we subsequently progressed through the Joint Strike Fighter program, made a full set of nozzles, did a series of engine tests. And these military engine testing um, successes led the company to significantly invest at the beginning of this decade. And although our prior commercial work was done on airfoils and combustor liners, we focused our initial maturation efforts on turbine shrouds. And turbine shrouds are really um, you know, the functionality is really related to maintaining a specific position and specific profile with which the annulus of where the turbine blades rotate. And so the specific clearance and holding that tight tolerance is very important. And there we thought the dimensional stability, the thermal stability of these ceramic composites would really um, shine through as we looked at how to take advantage of these materials inside the turbine. So that endeavor took several years before we got through a series of flight testing ultimately and put the material in service in 2016 on the LEAP high pressure turbine shroud. So I'll show you more on that. As we progressed on that, we looked at other applications within the turbine, both on the commercial and the military side. One of our key highlights is we made a series of high pressure and low pressure airfoils and shrouds in a advanced military demonstrator engine program called ADVENT, and we set Guinness uh, Book World Records for the highest turbine inlet temperatures um, throughout that engine. So that was definitely one of our key exciting engine test milestones that we accomplished. But we're looking beyond those types of engines as well, the helicopter applications, and so we're progressing there. We're also progressing on large commercial applications beyond the LEAP, which is called our GE9X engine. I'll tell you more about that. So next slide, please. So just taking a step back before we get further in, in looking at those applications is just making sure we're clear and looking at why CMCs are, you know, desirable within the turbine engine. We talked a bit about temperature capability, and that's really a driver from an engine performance standpoint. Certainly anything that's in the aerospace industry benefits from lighter weight. But then within CMCs themselves and the ceramic industry, the key to having a reliable performance for our machine and achieving the durability requirements that are in the orders of thousands of hours and tens of thousands of mission cycles for commercial engines in particular, damage tolerance is a very important attribute. And understanding and demonstrating engineering capability of this material to achieve the damage tolerance and meet the lifetime requirements really was a pacing item for maturation of this technology. So specifically there in the middle, we show the temperature capability benefit on the order of four to 500 degrees relative to the nickel-based super alloys. And relative to damage tolerance, there's a couple more examples of mechanical capability shown on the right. You see the stress strain response, and I think most know your brittle china and ceramics you see around the house in your everyday life has a stress strain curve that looks like a monolithic material that's shown in red because it indeed the form of the material is singular and there is nothing there to stop cracks as compared to a composite which says there's multiple forms of material and that therein lies 
you know, the aspect capturing the aspects of the fibers themselves combined with the matrix. And in the case of silicon carbide based composites, there's a third phase that's highly unique compared even to other composite systems, and it's the fiber coating itself. The fiber coating is really the key where a lot of the investment in engineering capability with NGE um, enables our system to be very unique in terms of its mechanical response. Now, a general response of this 66 CMC is shown there. The fiber coating enables, enables the yield type behavior that you're more accustomed to in a metallic alloy. But at the same time, beyond that, which gives us, you know, gives us the strain capability so you don't get a catastrophic event or a catastrophic failure, at least locally, you may get cracking, but you may prevent the cracking from progressing throughout the component due to that type of behavior. Beyond that, the examples below show when you absorb this energy and you have this cracking occur at the yield, you really ultimately load the fibers and so you see kind of more a fibrous type fracture there in the lower right. And we talk about fibers, they're quite small in diameter in this case. They're bundled typically 500 together. Individual filaments though are smaller than a human hair. And even as further demonstration of the mechanical toughness beyond just you know, a typical mechanical loading situation. We're showing where, and I've done this myself, you have to get big enough refractory nails so you don't bend the nail, but ultimately you can hammer the nail right through this piece of ceramic. And that really shows the toughness or damage tolerance that the material can withstand. And it really represents within an engine, you may have small projectiles, you may have other upstream components that are metallic or whatever that may fail and in the engine, you know, the gas flow is at something like a thousand feet per second. And you're going to have to withstand ballistic type conditions within, you know, the turbine engine. And this uh, demonstration here shows you that type of damage tolerance, which is critical to having a reliable component for our turbine, turbine engine components. Okay, next please. So our material compared to other composites has, has some unique attributes. One of the most significant is the interlaminar tensile strength. The microstructure shown on the left is, is you know, this material we call is multiple traded ultimately, and that you'll see the process in a minute in terms of how we introduce the silicon to form silicon carbide with molten silicon, so it's called MI for short. That is a very dense material you see there on the left. You also see individual fibers on four layers, there, there's a layer at the top that's um, in the plane of the page, and then there's two layers going in and out of the page, and there's a lower layer um, on the, on the uh, plane of the page. You see the shiny silicon metal that's residual within those, um, some of those layers, but you also see filaments, and you also see very dense silicon carbide around those filaments. Dense nature gives us a very strong matrix. It also gives us high interlaminar tensile strength. Over 10 KSI, in fact, and traditional composites fail below five, and in many cases, more like two KSI. And this difference really allows us to more broadly apply our material into structures where you turn corners, where you have fillets, um, and many of the features that you need to seal, to bond, to attach, and to make individual single complex parts out of, out of one material. And this is why we are talking airfoils now beyond simple structures like rings, or combustor liners at GE. Okay, next please. So the maturation that we've done, you know, we really have different organizations throughout the country. Um, folks that are focused more, more on the innovation aspect, proof of concepts, even including materials, manufacturing, designs. Then the site I'm at here, I'm, I'm talking to you from Cincinnati, Ohio. This is where our engineering headquarters is located. Our supply chain headquarters is located, although the sites are elsewhere. Um, I'll show you more of that in a minute. We call this group the FastWorks Lab, where we do the design, co-located with the manufacturing folks, and we really work through prototyping and concept development, set the recipe for the process, come up with the design rules, come up with the manufacturing rules, and it's there then we work with the sites to go through low rate and full rate production. And I'll tell you more about those sites here in a few minutes. Okay, next chart, please. But before getting to the sites, I wanna give you a little more feel of the type of work that we've had to do to introduce a new class of materials because nowhere 
has a ceramic structural application been successfully implemented into the field in turbine engines? And so it took a tremendous amount of test data to do that. And anyone that's worked with composites knows that there's building blocks that you go through, starting a coupon level, you go to sub-element level, you go to full component level, ultimately into the engine itself, and you, you, you develop the lifing, the mechanical performance, the ability to deal with manufacturing defects, and a tremendous amount of data to understand all these aspects, not the least of which is interlaminar properties because you have a composite strength control, load control, at different temperatures, how does it withstand cracking? We really, at this stage, have over 100 design data curves available to our design team to really understand and, and look at how does this material respond in various circumstances. And ultimately, this is how we got the material um, through FAA certification and uh, European Association certification in 2016. So next, please. So as a part of um, our maturation of this technology, it really all comes together, I think, by looking at how does the material, the ability to predict the life of the material, and that's on the right, and coming up with test methods, because in many cases, test methods did not exist to systematically understand how a crack progresses in a layered material that's made out of ceramic, and to what extent does the crack grow as you incrementally increase the loads? And those who work in this field may know there's parameters like G1C and so forth, and there's tools and methods, but we had to do a lot of development to validate those methods for this particular material and get a tremendous amount of test data to be able to predict the, the response um, over thousands of hours and many cycles. And what this ties to is understanding what defects or in your material, having the, the non-destructive methods to be able to quantify any manufacturing defects and be able to translate that into the life so that you can set limits on the size of defects that are allowed. And in our case, X-ray CT is often used in our production applications, at least if the parts are small enough to fit into an X-ray machine. We prefer to do that to give us the highest resolution. But there's sound and light methods and heat methods that also are reasonably effective for larger parts or various parts of different types of geometries or thicknesses. But what goes hand in hand with that that is often overlooked, and anyone that's worked, you know, US government programs, you know there's manufacturing readiness levels that go hand in hand with a lot of what I've talked about so far as technology readiness levels and all those aspects. And in order to do that, the physics-based understanding of what's happening in your manufacturing process and how does it lead to any of those defects or features you see in the microstructure and getting the physics-based and chemical-based models in place for all the manufacturing processes is absolutely essential before you can fully mature the technology and verify and validate that you have all the knowledge that you need to go forward, go into high-rate production, and actually support a part in the field from a lifing behavior standpoint. Next, please. So when we talk about the applications, I mentioned the high pressure turbine shroud that in 2016, so five years in now of service on the LEAP engine, we have over 80 million flight hours um, on our components. And we have over 100,000 LEAP shrouds that we have produced to date. And tremendous amount of learning, taking a new technology, a new manufacturing process and getting it to high yield. But I can say, with a big smile that we are very high in manufacturing yields over the last couple of years on this component to produce 100,000 of them within the last few years. To support all of that, we have to produce silicon carbide-based materials that you can measure in tons on an annual basis. And it's a lot to say if you think about a material that is 0.1 pounds per cubic inch from a density standpoint and we measure the output in tons, which is really amazing. And so our silicon carbide base raw material plant um, is producing tapes that support all these applications. Um, and some of the applications, the biggest one of which is the combustor liners, we're in the process of certifying on the GE9X. So in addition to the shrouds, we have the combustor liners there. 
the largest of which is over a meter in diameter. And they will be in service um, next year on the Boeing 777X. And there's five CMC part numbers there. In addition to the liners and shrouds, there are turbine nodules that are very complex cool components um, that we are now producing to support that. And we've had a number of successful engine tests with all that hardware through a certification program. Okay, so that's our commercial production applications. They're driving high volumes. If you move forward, please. This shows the infrastructure that we put in place. So when you talk about GE's overall investment in the technology, most of which has been within the last 10 years, as we've moved and progressed and matured the technology, we've also matured the supply chain, the manufacturing readiness, industrialization, if you will, in the plants that are shown here. Many in the Southeast, the raw materials are in Huntsville, Alabama. There we coat the fibers, and we're also in the process of setting up the manufacturing of the fibers, which is currently done in Japan. Um, will soon be done here in the United States, and will be otherwise everything is fully vertically integrated. And so, coated fibers turned into a prepreg, turned into sheets. Um, all that work is done in Huntsville, Alabama. I just flew back from there this morning. We are then shipping those sheets um, a couple states over east to North Carolina. We're in Asheville, in the beautiful city of Asheville. We have a high volume component manufacturing site that makes each of the components themselves from those sheets. And at that site, it involves traditional autoclave processing to lay up and consolidate a part around the tool. Then there's some ceramic processing to turn it into a silicon carbide material that has excess silicon metal from the molten silicon infiltration process. Finishing operations like machining are many. Traditional machining operations that are specially adapted to work for our ceramic. The inspections that we discussed, and lastly, in many cases, especially for long-time commercial applications. There is an environmental challenge there that bigger coatings are required to handle. And we put those down in North Carolina, and then, well, nearby South Carolina, um, in a joint venture there that you see. And then our facility that's really been key to all our technology has been a thread throughout our development through the many phases that we progressed is in Newark, Delaware. And we're standing that up mainly for military work as we support the commercial work in our other sites. Okay, that's our fully vertically integrated supply chain in the U.S. So if we move forward, please. Most all I've talked to is the MI66, and you see a little more description there. I think I've covered most of it. I'm just using this now to transition, talk a little bit about our other materials. The commonality with them is that they're CVI-based, or chemical vapor infiltration. So it's gas phase deposition of silicon carbide. Again, it's silicon carbide based matrix um, as opposed to a liquid based molten infiltrated uh, densification process. With the gas phase processes, I'll show you a picture of the reactors in a minute. In this case, we use a uh, carbon fiber. Um, so it's a lower cost raw material. There is a much simpler fiber coating. We use more traditional woven textile processing and with the carbon fiber, we get higher temperature capability, and that's really where this material can be used, although shorter times. So it's not really suited for turbine engine applications, but it is suited for um, you know, hypersonic or space applications where shorter time durations are required. So this shows the process for the CVI carbon SICK. Um, and so the woven material is also prepreg, laid up in a traditional autoclave process a thin layer of carbon coating is put on, and then the gas the deposition processes in the reactors. The reactors to deposit silicon carbide are in the background of the photo. You'll see three reaction lids there. This is up in the mezzanine, as where the picture below is the ground level view of these large chambers um, that are production scale units. And these are components that we make from this equipment. You'll see, um, some large structures that are made for space vehicles like the X-37. Um, you'll see some missile applications, some space capsule applications. Some of these textiles use braiding and other processes to make very large complex shapes. And lastly, if you move forward, um, you know, in, I think there's a summary slide maybe we just skipped. If you can go back, please. 
Okay, thanks. So yeah, just to recap everything that we've covered here, um, you know, I went through some of the turbine engine performance benefits we get from using CMC, specifically the 6.6, our investment to mature that there we discussed, and all the types of testing um, at both coupon level, engine level, the modeling and all that enables our, um, you know, teams to successively predict the life and performance of these composites. It takes a lot of deep domain expertise. We also reviewed the superior performance that our materials have. They're very unique, especially the interlaminar strengths. If you look at layered composite laminated structures, the interlaminar failure is the most common failure mode that really limits to the designs. A lot of systems, a lot of failure modes, people think of a delamination or high interlaminar strengths reduce potential for that to happen. So it really enables broader applicability of the composites. So we've really invested in our, in our US supply chain to set this up. We have additional capacity and I'm actively seeking growing our market and applications beyond turbine engines. So thank you for your time. I hope there's lots of questions as we have time available and I look forward to conversing with you shortly. Yes, there there are questions coming in and we're gonna give it uh, another minute or two to uh, okay. um, let the voting occur. So in the meantime though, got a couple of questions just to get things rolling. Sure. Uh, Jim, so um, excellent presentation, really enjoyed it and, and I hope the audience did as well. Um, okay. Regarding applications for CMCs, what, what are the, the primary characteristics that you look for for best applications? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. Within the turbine engine, really the performance is driven by the temperature capability, but then that has to go hand in hand with some of the mechanical um, attributes. And we, we discussed interlaminal tensile strength, but I think what it really comes together for this application and for others, which may not be at high temperature, is to more simply think about the stability of the material in terms of its shape stability. And you think of how the shroud performs, it's really shape stability that enables it to work well in that application. And I think even if you look at cryogenic conditions, you look at space applications that are very cold, a lot of applications and needs there are driven by the need for a material to be shape stable at a very cold condition, which I think is also where you know our attributes can play well at a broad temperature range, not just the high temperatures in a turbine engine. Okay. Okay. That second question is around um, GE's obviously made a significant investment over the years into this mm -hmm. space uh, from the materials through through the production of parts. Um, is GE willing to supply CMC components to other companies and, and have they done so in the past if, if that's the case? Yeah, so I'm glad you bring that up because for a long time and you know I've been working as technology nearly 30 years, it's been very close to the vest. And, it, and you know it's a very competitive area within a turbine engine market. But that was really a business decision to shift our strategy once we have all the capabilities set up and we have demonstrated you know, supplying to our own needs that we can reliably produce parts at high yields at a cost-effective manufacturing way that then enables us to look for other customers who might benefit from this technology. And certainly, you know, as we've seen the hypersonics movement that's going within the U.S., um, there are needs there that we're really excited about trying to help the U.S. government satisfy because high temperature materials are certainly expected, you know, when you're going really fast at, at, at some of these applications. Great. Thank you. And last mm -hmm. question before we get to the polls is because around cost. Um, how does how does CMC, the cost of CNC components compare to uh, traditional metallic parts, and how do you see overall cost of CNC parts trending these days? Yeah, perfect. I think um, we're through the steepest part of the learning curve um, with what we're doing, but there's still room to further reduce the cost. I think at this stage, now that we're full rate production, we're getting the economies of scale working for us. We're getting the high yields working for us. Um, and now we're focused on making some investments in areas where we might be able to do automation and do some things where we can take out some labor. And so there's still opportunities to currently drive the price down further. Now for a turbine engine application, you know, mentioned before our benchmark is really single crystal super alloys. And for those types of components, you know, our benchmark has been to get within 
two to three X of the cost of super alloys and the value that CMCs bring from an overall product performance benefit will really be favorable um, in, the, in the overall return on investment. So that's the cost challenge that we are actively um, uh, working toward here for turbine engines. Okay, and, and in no particular order, I just went through the top okay. of the list. And the first one is, can you tell us a little bit more about the machining processes used for CMCs? Sure. Um, the good news is that the machining processes that are traditionally used on metals are all applicable. Even things like electro discharge machining or laser drilling or many of your more traditional turning and grinding operations. Really, in all cases, though, it takes a fair amount of development to try to apply those to a much harder material, right? A material that has a machining tool market in and of itself because it is a machining tool. So we are um, enabled by, you know, alternate machining tools like diamond coated in the case of your grinding or turning or in the case of EDM, maybe changing your electrodes out and so on. But um, really in all cases, we're able to utilize these different types of methods that are commonly available. Okay, thanks. Jim, just so you know, we've got uh, um, another 12, 15, uh, 12 or so questions to go through. So there's a lot of questions coming in. Okay. This one's from uh, Gabinda Saha. It's a high in your manufacturing process flow. One of the steps is barrier coating. What is the role of this barrier coating? I understand you will be using high temperature process to deposit a CMC. My question is, will the high temperature not compromise the integrity of the bonding quality? That's a lot there. Did you get that? Yeah, so there's, yeah, so there's a couple aspects. There is, there is a regime of pressure and temperature and gas chemistry that leads to um, degradation of the oxide that's formed on the CMC if it's uncoated and bare. So therefore, we use the barrier coating to deal with that. Now, the barrier coating itself, there's common methods again used like for you know plasma spraying, thermal barrier coatings on metals that we employ. Again, have to tailor it for our materials and whatnot. Um, but those traditional processes do give us bonding that's um, suitable to give us the very long lives for these coated parts. Okay, what are the greatest challenges facing preforming of complex shapes out of cut and stock, and how do you see these being addressed in volume production? Interesting question. Yeah, that's a great question. Someone that's working in the composite industry, it sounds like. Um, so these materials are have bulk of 10 to 20 volume percent. Um, so obviously with any material that has debulking involved, you've got to come up with novel tooling approaches to try to accommodate the volume change. Um, so that leads to some, some developments. I think when we talk automation, we're talking, you know, the manual layup applies. If you look at a lot of our parts, they're very small. They have a high ply count. So automation in that area would be very beneficial. And at the same time, like traditional composites, we're trying to minimize the amount of time we're in the autoclave equipment itself. There's a more we can do prior to you put it into the autoclave would really give us opportunities to simplify and reduce the cost of the preforming operations themselves. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, next questions from, uh, well, I, it just moved on me. Give me one second. It was from. Okay. See if I can find it here from Damien. When it comes to machining CMCs, what are the main difficulties, and would GE be willing to work with machining expert, experts to qualify dedicated tools, new ways of manufacturing? Absolutely. We have examples where we've done that, and we're always looking for ways to improve our processes. So I appreciate your interest. Absolutely. Please reach Absolutely. out. That was a quick yes. Uh, um, John asks, uh, what temp ranges or applications does GE default to the test costly, the, the least costly OXOX CMCs rather than 6-6? Six, six? Right. 
So certainly you may know, some of you may know or may not know, we do have an OXOX CMC system and a lot of experience with it. This uh, session today was obviously focused on non-oxide CMCs. Um, the oxide CMCs have some limited usage, I would say, in specialized applications that might take advantage of their attributes that are a bit different than CMCs, but I would just say they're less structural in nature. And so that pushes you away from some of the hot section components that we talked about. Okay. Okay. Um, Yao Ping asks, CMCs for hypersonic leading edge, question mark? Absolutely. Um, we're working it. We're getting some uh, testing and arc jets um, across the country to prove out our ability in applications like that. Okay. I'm going to skip over one that's another, along the lines of uh, challenges for tooling. We've kind of talked that some. Okay. What joining approaches are you using with CMCs? So, in our case, the, melt, the molten silicon infiltration process, it can be thought of as an inherent joining method because you are converting carbon to silicon and creating bonds while you're creating the part. So joining for us is really co-processing. It's not really your traditional bonding. You're not bringing in a secondary bonding agent and it's not necessary. And just co-processing allows us to make very large complex multi-piece assemblies. Okay. Um, Jasmine asks, are you use, also using OXOX or carbon-carbon uh, composites for part of the engine? There are some limited applications for OXOX, that's correct. And, um, you know, it's a simpler technology. It was matured earlier and it was in production um, prior to these non oxide based materials. In addition, I would say that um, for carbon carbon, though, it does not have the oxidation stability that you need for turbine engine conditions and certainly not the lifetimes or the lifetimes that we need for turbine engines. Okay. Um, let's see here. Jasmine's uh, got a couple of questions coming here. Are you using certain coating for your six sick composites for the service and are you using cold spray that's mm -hmm. i'll go ahead and give you that one yeah that's fine and i and it, you know i kind of talked on it earlier it is a plasma spray type process that we really use um, we do not use cold spray processing i mean these are rare earth silicate materials and so it takes a lot of energy to um, melt them and deposit them using some more traditional processes. Okay. I'm going to go over a couple of Jasmine's to get to some other ones. Um, okay. Stephen asked, you mentioned the joint venture in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve led um, South Carolina Aerospace promoting the aerospace industry in South Carolina and um, was a former GE employee as well. The uh, the list kind of moved on me here. Give me a second to get back okay. to this question. Okay. Okay. Um, but basically, um, where'd he go? Yeah. Um, and he's a former GE employee. Would love to learn more about the joint venture and connect okay. with them if you can give him a point of contact. And maybe that's why we reach out. You reach out through uh, Carl. I don't know. What What's your thoughts, Jim? Reach out through Carl, you can find me on LinkedIn, and that might be, might be the easiest way to connect directly. Yeah, okay. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Stephen, um, for, for the question. Um, uh, Anonymous asked, uh, do you really have predictive process models for 3D parts slash structures, not 2D simulations for every That's step correct. of the process? Yes, for all the, for all the thermal processes, um, including coating the fiber, um, including putting it in an autoclave, which takes some heat and temperature, and burning it out, and then lastly, densifying it. And we, we use the typical TRL, MRL tow gates as we look to track the progress and make sure that we're getting the rigor that we need into 
um, maturing those models and validating them and demonstrating their capability. Okay, we got a few more questions and it looks okay. like time permits if you're good. Um, Daniel says, we can, we can form ceramics as a polymer at sub-zero temperatures where the cell wall is only 20 to 100 micrometers. Do you have any experience debinding and sintering ultra-thin ceramic substrates? Substrates. If so, did the substrates curl up and center okay? So I've done a lot of work in sintering, but it's outside composites. Um, and in those cases, it was using powders as raw materials, so polymers were not involved. And so, yeah, I know you got different considerations, right? With shrinkage, you're gonna lose mass, you're gonna lose material. And um, I can appreciate the challenge, but I don't have any direct experience trying to address that challenge. Okay. I don't know if I covered this one, so I went back up to the top of the list to see if any new ones. Uh, this one's from Chris about how important is it to control the level of porosity within, within the CMCs and what level of porosity is optimal? Yeah. No, that's that's a great question. I kind of touched on the ability to do it. Didn't get into specifics on what's allowed, but just just looking at the fracture behavior of ceramics in general, their sense their high sensitivity to voids and defects and pores, that really translates in a composite world to impacts to our interlaminar strengths. So we really do have to get a dense material. And that's part of what makes our technology unique. That's part of why GE has CMCs and engines and others don't, as other CMCs typically have a fair amount of porosity in them, and that limits their ability to use them in an engine. So quantifying that, having a process to do it, but also a means to inspect and control is really critical to using the material. Hey, I'm going to, uh, since, you, since you use the, world, the words uh, composite, world. I'm going to go to Ginger Gardner. <laughs> okay. So yeah. for for uh, your Oxox CMCs, are you looking at more automated processing like AFP? Um, I know we've done a lot of work of that in the past as we've looked at larger structures and so forth. Um, so yeah, those are the types of things that have been looked at a development level, but they're not in production. Yeah. That one's near and dear to my heart. Um, Any other comments you want to make on that, Randy? Um, no, I, I, I have an appreciation for um, uh, the, the challenges and the, and the layup of the CMC materials yeah. and uh, obviously significant experience on the polymer side. And I agree with you. It's it's a ways away, I guess, as a longtime fiber placement person. I, I hope mm -hmm. someday it gets there, though. Okay. Um, is, and Ginger also asks, is GE looking add additive manufacturing techniques for producing CMCs? Um, certainly additive manufacturing is a strength of our company. I would call it a close um, parallel to CMCs in many ways because it's been an emerging technology that has been implemented on our engines recently. And certainly, we've got to continue to find ways to use that technology the best we can to to uh, try to bring it into beyond metals and other materials. Okay. We've got, um, oops, just changed on me. Some of these right when I'm getting ready to read them. Uh, from Anonymous, is GE interested in producing, uh, hang on, where'd it go? We just had a, a few more to drop in. Is GE interested in producing CMC-based materials for low-level tech applications? Um, I would say yes, but I think like anything, you know, as I look at, you know, what markets make sense for this material, we often obviously have to consider, like we did with turbine engines, what value the material brings. I mean, because really, if you look at the spectrum of the types of CMCs, um, you know, they come with the different cost points. I think um, 
there's some less capable CMCs that may be cheaper that might be better suited for those types of applications. Okay. okay. Um, I, I think um, you may have already answered this one, but I will, will, will repeat it. Are you willing to share your contact information for further discussions? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think LinkedIn would be an easy one if folks just want to reach out that way. Or you can just put a dot between the M and the S and put at GE.com and you can reach me by email. Okay. Yeah, Jim, if, if you don't mind, um, I will leave my contact information just because that's come up more than once. I'll leave my contact information. Uh, we'll send a post uh, email to everyone and they okay. can contact me and I can make the, I can also make the connection directly through my email and introduce. So that's another option. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Carl. And Carl, we'll, we'll just keep going until you, you uh, let us know um, on the questions. They just, they keep coming in. Um, from uh, Bobek, what type of tools are used for CMC layup and how are those tools generally manufactured? Yeah, no, that's good. Um, we look at um, pretty traditional tooling materials and um, there's forms of steel, aluminum that work well. You're trying to match the CTE, coefficient of thermal expansion, but at the same time, you want something that you can use that will respond thermally and yet be producible. And so when we talk about the second half of your question, I mean, we can do things um, with additive manufacturing to make cheap, complex metallic tools. We can do more traditional machining hog out methods. A lot of times that's typically what's done. Um, but yeah, it's some combination of those. Okay. Here's a pretty specific question. Um, from cure to burnout process, how do you control the level of porosity to make sure the CMC is permeable enough for the melt inf infiltration process? It goes on for a second. The preference is over open pores to closed pores. That's a question. How do you control the process parameters to have more open pores than closed pores? Yeah, so there's a lot to that question. Yeah, and um, but, may not be able to answer it all too, but go well, ahead. Yeah, in terms yeah, of I technical. Mean, yeah, yeah, in terms of technical, the general aspects are right that you've got the the tooling method and all the other I call it processing aids that you might use inside the tool to help be able to degas um, and control the volatiles and all the organics that are coming out in the tool. And then the second entry question is there's you know, thermal cycles and how you control temperature, pressure, and environments that need to be really tailored so that you can manage, again, the outgassing and any subsequent steps before you introduce new material such that you have a condition that's suitable for capillary flow because molten silicon is really um, capillary flow into a porous medium. And so your question is very pertinent from that standpoint. Yeah, it was very, very targeted. Um, Good, good question and um, good answer. In which, let's see here, in which aspect of machining process does GE, I think is what they're, look, they're meant to say, mm -hmm. looking forward to accomplish in the upcoming five years? So it's a, in the next five years, what machining process changes capabilities do we look to, to accomplish? Yeah, I think, I think one thing that stands, a couple of things that stand out. One of them is platforms where we can make larger parts. Uh, machines and, and tools that, you know, enable that fixturing that enables to make larger parts as we move, you know, beyond turbine engines, which most of our turbine engine parts are relatively small to what's going on in, in, in some of these other DO Department of Defense applications. So that's a, a major driver there. Um, like with anything else, we're trying to take out cost. You know, are there other ways to do these diamond coated tools that we're required right now that might give us um, cheaper tooling options because we go through a lot of them. We go through them really fast. So, you know, those are, are, are considerations there. And then uh, John just sent in a question back to the tooling. Mm -hmm. um, what's used for release agents on the tool surface? Is it off the shelf product? Um, it is. It's, 
it's um, sheet material and different types of sheet material that we use um, that work really well. Okay. Um, I know there was a couple down at the bottom from uh, Desmond that I didn't answer. Um, went down to see, but basically we're we're all caught up on them. Okay, good. So I'm not sure. I got to go back to see if I can see Jasmine. So I I think we're good, um, Carl, from our side. Unless there's another question that just came in. Yeah, I no. This is this is great. I think we can continue to go on for a while. The questions keep coming in, and I think the last question that I just saw that was published uh, came from John. And since I'm here, I'll ask it. Um, the question from John is back to the tooling. What's What's used for release agents on tool surface in we covered that one. Oh, you did? We, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we got yep. that one. Yep. yep. And I was going to go down below to find, trying to find some of Jasmine's. He, he had the number of them in a row, and I thought I would uh, uh, spread the questions out a little bit to others as well. I did take a couple of his earlier. I'll find, you know what, I'll, I'll find that one. I was keeping notes. Um, I'll find that, and we'll address it maybe just um, – after this webinar, I'll, I'll send an email and we'll we'll post it back um, right. to that individual uh, on a one-to-one okay. -one basis. So, um, yeah, again, thank you very much. Um, this was super informative, and I'm getting you know some comments are rolling in saying that we really appreciated um, the technical aspect of what was presented. So, um, uh, I, again, I had a feeling mm -hmm. this this can go on with for a while with Q and A, but a special get uh, special thanks once again. Um, to Randy and Jim for providing their knowledge and their technical insights um, into GE Aviation ceramic matrix composites. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a lot of interest in this just based on what we've experienced right now. Uh, we appreciate your time in supporting the manufacturing community and, of course, SME events. And a very special thanks um, to all of our guests who participated today. Um, I hope you enjoy the conversation and look forward to seeing you again on future webinars. Um, again, this webinar has been recorded, and we will make this available shortly. Uh, by Friday, probably noon, it'll be on our uh, AeroDef event website. And uh, finally, kind of looking forward into um, what's happening in the next couple of months before our year end, we're getting back into the face-to-face -face events. And specifically, um, we will be launching live uh, at Long Beach Convention Center, AeroDef 2021, November 16th to the 18th at the Long Beach Convention Center. So um, registration is open for that uh, for that event and uh, and conference. And we're actually promoting an early bird special for the technical conference pass uh, for only $400. So that's a great value for uh, for those looking uh, for more technical information. Um, inside the conference. Um, thank you everyone for your time. Um, we'll give you one or two minutes back, but it was a pleasure uh, to spend it with you. And we, we thank you for investing your time back in us. And again, have a great rest of your day, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you down the road. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.